class and welcome to chapter 15. Uh, chapter 15 is really on the immune system. Um, the lymphatic system is kind of included in this, but it's the body's basically um, way to defend itself against anything foreign, uh, whether that's some sort of disease um, or other substance. So an introduction to the body's defense mechanisms, uh, it will protect against any disease causing agents. And we call any uh, agent that causes a disease, a pathogen. Um, and these make up the immune system. There's two types. There's innate immunity, which is nonspecific. This is what we all inherit. And then there's adaptive or specific immunity. And this is learned from exposure to specific pathogens or disease causing agents. Um, and this is where the function of your lymphocytes comes in. So innate immunity includes external and internal defenses. It serves as the body's first line of defense against pathogens. Um, and the examples of innate immunity are all of your membranes, membranes of epithelial tissue, whether that's skin or all of the membranes that lined your internal or external um, linings of the organs. High acidity in the stomach is also innate immunity. Uh, cells that can engulf or kill pathogens and also fever. So this is a look at your body's kind of first line of defense. Um, and we call this, again, this is nonspecific or innate immunity. So I'd encourage you guys to read through this, uh, just to become a little familiar with some of these um, uh, nonspecific mechanisms. Activation of innate immunity. Uh, this is when you have cells which distinguish self from non-self using what we call pathogen associated molecular patterns, which are very unique to a specific type of pathogen. So basically the cells can distinguish what's itself and what is the non-self, which would be some sort of um, pathogen or pathogen associated molecular pattern. Uh, the complement system integrates innate and adaptive immunity, immune responses. It will consist of proteins in your plasma that become activated when antibodies bind to antigens and the complement proteins will promote phagocytosis, which is just the engulfing of anything foreign, uh, the lysis of target cells, which is this, the splitting open of the cell that's being targeted, and also the inflammation response. Uh, local inflammation will cause tissue damage. So tissue damage in the area of local inflammation will cause necrosis or scarring of that tissue. Um, the immune system will be exposed to danger associated molecular patterns, and this will stimulate innate immune responses and inflammation. A phagocytosis, there's three types of phagocytic cells. Um, neutrophils are always the first to arrive at an infection. And again, phagocytosis is this idea of engulfing something foreign and then tearing it apart. So neutrophils will be the first to arrive mononuclear phagocytic cells um, are monocytes in the blood and macrophages and dendritic cells in the tissues, they will arrive later. There are also organ specific phagocytes in the liver, spleen, lymph nodes, lungs, and brain. Uh, some of these are called fixed phagocytes um, and all others are um, movable. So this is a look at the phagocytic cells and where they'll be located throughout the body. Uh, phagocytosis in tissues. This will take you through a couple steps. Um, the neutrophils and monocytes will squeeze through gaps in um, capillary venule walls in a process that we call uh, diapedesis. They'll be attracted to a site by a process called chemotaxis by cytokines, which are called chemokines, just a specific protein uh, that will attract these neutrophils and monocytes. Um, then the pathogen becomes engulfed by what we call pseudopods and the vacuole containing the pathogen will fuse with a lysosome. And the lysosome is what will then would be responsible for digesting that pathogen. So this is just a look at how white blood cells migrate to an area of bacteria or something foreign. So again, they'll squeeze through these venule um, post-capillary walls, and then they will engulf um, the bacteria, and that's the phagocytosis. And then this uh, neutrophil will take the bacteria or a lysosome will completely degrade uh, that entire uh, bacteria. Here's phagocytosis by a neutrophil or macrophage. Um, so really similarly, so basically the bacterium is engulfed 
And then we have lysosomal enzymes, which will surround that bacteria and degrade it, um, and then spit that bacteria back out when it's been degraded. Uh, fever is regulated by your hypothalamus area in the brain. Uh, a chemical called an endogenous pyrogen will set the body temperature higher. Um, this basically, along with fever, um, it produces endotoxins, which are from some bacteria, which will stimulate leukocytes to produce these cytokines. Along with fever, they also induce sleepiness and a fall in plasma iron concentration, which will limit uh, bacterial activity. Uh, adaptive immunity is the acquired ability to defend against a specific pathogen after exposure. And this is always mediated by antigens and antibodies. Antigens are cell surface molecules that stimulate the production of specific antibodies and combine with those antibodies. Um, so a foreign antigen will elicit an immune response so that immune, the immune system can distinguish the cell from non-self antibodies will bind to their specific antigens, and then large molecules can have several antigenic determinant sites that will stimulate the production of and binding to the antibody itself. So this just shows how the antibodies um, are attached to latex particles, and then they will be able to bind to an antigen X. And when they bind to that antigen, which again would be something foreign or non-self, they would clump up those antigens together and we would see clumping or agglutination. Uh, lymphocytes are derived from stem cells in the bone marrow. These stem cells will seed the thymus, spleen, and lymph nodes, so that's where the, they will be located. Uh, the thymus is the site of new T, T lymphocytes through late childhood, but it that will then degenerate in adulthood. And the bone marrow and thymus are considered primary lymphoid organs. T lymphocytes um, are just lymphocytes in the thymus that become T lymphocytes, and then they will go on and be in your blood, lymph nodes, and spleen. Uh, T lymphocytes will attack host cells that have become infected with a virus or fungus, transplanted human cells, cancer cells. Uh, T lymphocytes do not produce antibodies. They must be in close proximity to the victim cell in order to destroy it, and this is called cell-mediated immunity. B lymphocytes, on the other hand, come directly from bone marrow. Uh, they combat bacterial and some viral infections. They will secrete antibodies into the blood and lymph so they can be far farther away from the victim. And this is called humoral immunity or antibody mediated immunity. So this is just a good kind of difference between B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. And you should have a general understanding of the differences between the two uh, because they are two, the two main lymphocytes that we talk about. Uh, they, these are their secondary lymphoid organs, your lymph nodes, spleen, tonsil, and Peyer's patches. Um, what these will do is capture and present your pathogens to macrophages and also house your lymphocytes. And then lymphocytes will migrate uh, between the lymphoid organs to the sample blood and lymph. Uh, local inflammation occurs when bacteria enters a break in the skin, and this will be initiated by a nonspecific mechanism of phagocytosis. Um, so this will be local inflammation at the area when bacteria enters the skin. Um, mast cells will degranulate and secrete things like heparin, histamine, prostaglandins, leukotriene, cytokines, um, and TNFA alpha. And these will just produce a warmth or swelling and pain, which are classic symptoms of a local inflammation. You, it gets warmer, it swells, there's pain associated with it. Um, these cells might also recruit more, recruit more leukocytes to that area. Uh, neutrophils will kill microorganisms through phagocytosis. They will release these um, neutrophil extracellular traps to actually trap pathogens. Um, so that's what's interesting about neutrophils. Monocytes will enlarge into macrophages um, and phagocytose apoptotic neutrophils and also release growth factors and other agents that will end inflammation and promote repair. As inflammation progresses, B lymphocytes will produce antibodies against bacterial antigens. Um, so that's just as the inflammation progresses. So this is a look at infiltration of an inflamed site by the leukocytes and how the leukocytes over the period of hours 
um, will come to that area of inflammation. So again, um, neutrophils will come in very strong, very intense to that area of inflammation, and they'll be first on the scene. Then monocytes will follow, um, and then T lymphocytes will follow. And you can see um, how the rise in intensity means um, if more of them are recruited to that area. And again, over the course of time, um, this is a 48 hour time lap lapse showing how leukocytes get there um, and how quickly they will be there. So local inflammation, um, more symptoms, redness and warmth, that's due to histamine, stimulated vasodilation of your blood vessels, swelling, um, pain, um, release of these prostaglandins, uh, pus, which is just the phagocytosis engulfing that bacteria and then releasing it as pus. So those are symptoms that I'm sure we're all familiar with. And this takes us through kind of the events of local inflammation and what occurs, the release of histamine, the phagocytic cell, the engulfing, the antibodies that will be released um, to try to coat a bacteria and bind to it to produce clumping, and then the lysosome to try to um, break apart that bacteria. So it's a really coordinated response, um, but it's kind of beautiful in a way, beautiful in a way of how your body gets rid of um, any sort of bacteria or foreign. So this is a great summary of events in local inflammation if we're looking at an innate, a non-specific immunity, or an adaptive, a specific immunity. So I'll let you read through kind of that summary. Uh, functions of B lymphocytes. Exposure to an antigen will activate a B lymphocyte, and this will enter the secondary lymphoid organ, and then it will undergo multiple cell divisions, and we call that cloning. So this is a look at how B lymphocytes will become plasma and memory cells. So the antigens will bind to antibody receptors. Um, they will divide, so we call that proliferation, causes the formation of a clone. And then these clones will go on to become plasma cells and memory cells that are formed, um, taking into effect knowing that interaction between the antibody and antigen. Antibodies are also called immunoglobulins, and there's five classes of immunoglobulins, and they're shown there. These are the different immunoglobulins. Um, there might be a question about immunoglobulins and their functions, because these are basically the five types of antibodies you have in the body. Um, so this is something important to take some time to learn. Antibody structure, it's a Y-shaped protein. Um, B lymphocytes have antibodies on the plasma membranes that are receptors for antigens. So basically here is just the Y-shaped structure of an antibody. And this is showing um, the B lymphocyte, just showing the receptor of the antibody attached to the B cell itself. Um, so a B cell can have its own antibody receptor. And again, um, these antibodies will bind to specific antigens that it recognizes as non-self or something foreign. Uh, there's a diversity of antibodies. Everyone has about 10 to the 20th, so that's a lot of zeros, antibody molecules. There are a few million different specificities, and there should be an antibody for every antigen you might encounter, which is pretty amazing. Um, so there's just, this takes you through some of the diversity of structure of antibodies and the mechanisms for making them so diverse. All I want you to know is that antibodies are extremely diverse and they are formed um, to basically be some sort of um, defense mechanism for any antigen or anything that your body would recognize as non-self. So again, this shows you the antibody antigen complex. Um, there's a heavy chain and a light chain in light green and how they come together to form a specific kind of receptor area for an antigen that will bind to it. So every antibody is specific for a particular antigen. Um, the complement system is a part of the nonspecific defense system. Activity is triggered by binding of antibodies to antigens and also by polysaccharides, which are chains of sugar on bacterial membranes. Uh, the binding of antibodies to antigens does not destroy the pathogen. It just labels the target uh, for attack by a different phagocytic cell to stimulate opsonization, which is just um, kind of engulfing it and destroying it. Functions of T lymphocytes then, we have killer T lymphocytes. Um, they have a surface molecule called CD8 on them and they will destroy your body cells that harbor foreign antigens. Um, the cell mediated destruction will mean the T cells must touch the target victim. So those are your killer T cells or killer T lymphocytes. 
Helper T lymphocytes have this surface molecule, CD4. Um, they will improve the ability of B lymphocytes to become plasma cells and also enhance the ability of cytotoxic T cells to kill their targets. We have regulatory T lymphocytes. Um, these just help regulate um, different ways to inhibit a response of B lymphocytes. So they kind of regulate the process. So here's a look at a summary of an antigen, um, whether the B lymphocyte takes care of it or the T lymphocytes and then the different types of each. Here's the interaction between antigen presenting cells and T cells and B cells. Um, again, showing how this CD8 co-receptor uh, will be in a cytotoxic T cell. And again, showing a, a foreign antigen binding to a CD4 receptor and in, an, in a um, class two antigen presenting cell. AIDS and HIV. So AIDS is also known as the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. It has killed many millions of people worldwide and millions more are currently infected. And AIDS is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, which preferentially will infect and destroy these helper T cells, particularly those in the GI mucosa in the GI tract, where up to 30% of your helper T cells reside. So what HIV does is it basically just results in a decreased immunological function and greater susceptibility to opportunistic infections and cancer. So it just kind of breaks apart your body's defense mechanisms and the ability to um, protect itself against, against other infections and other cancer because it destroys these helper T cells. Active and passive immunity, it's really important to know the difference between active and passive immunity. Um, we'll talk about vaccines. So I want you to have a good understanding of active and passive immunity, and we'll talk about virulence and antigenicity, where a disease, the virulent agent, um, will be affected with antigens or virulence. Vaccines can help against antigens and virulence, but vaccination is part of this active immunity response. Uh, so the primary and secondary response of active immunity. So after infection, it takes about five to 10 days before antibodies are detected in the blood. So the person will get sick. This is the primary response. The secondary response is later exposure to the same infection results in a maximum antibody production in less than two hours. And the person will likely never get sick in the secondary response. So this just shows the um, plasma antibody concentration in the primary response versus the secondary response and week after exposure to the antigen. So in the primary response, it takes at least one to five weeks to create all of these antigens in the plasma. But if you're exposed to it again, um, all of those plasma antibodies are increasing right away in less than a week in the plasma concentration levels. Clonal selection theory just explains how the secondary immune response works. So a person inherits lymphocytes specific to almost every pathogen, but there are only a few of each type. So when you're exposed to anything foreign, your immune cells will respond uh, by making copies of themselves. And this is where this clonal selection theory comes in. Uh, germinal centers, which are in your secondary lymphoid organs will develop to produce these clones. The primary response triggers a massive production of cells that can respond to that antigen. And these cells will respond much quicker after exposure a second time. Uh, active immunity is the development of a secondary response which will provide active immunity. It will require prior exposure to the antigen which will then protect the body from future infections. Um, active immunity is what we use to make vaccines. And these vaccines include an antigen but are not virulent. So they're not disease causing. So here's a look at clonal selection, how in the first day up to the fifth day, fifth day how these memory cells are formed, um, which is just showing the development of the clone um, with the B cell. So this is a look at the summary of the clonal selection theory and your B cells. It takes you through the process and the result of that, um, all those summary processes. Uh, vaccines. So vaccines will stimulate a primary response and active immunity without actually making a person sick. Um, so this is, there are three ways to accomplish this. They, um, they, they're used, they use a killed virus. 
So the Salk polio vaccine, they use a killed virus. They use a live virus with an attenuated virulence. That is the virus either cannot replicate or cannot infect um, tissues. So an example of this is the Sabin polio vaccine or the MMR, um, or they use a genetically engineered, engineered recombinant virus like the hepatitis B. So these will be um, active immunity given to people, but without making the person sick because they're using different viruses that are genetically engineered. Um, they're viruses that cannot repli replicate or they are what we call killed viruses. Um, adjuvants are molecules that boost immune responses when delivered with the vaccine antigens. Um, so immunological tolerance um, or competence is the ability to mount an immune response will develop during the early postnatal life in babies, being able to distinguish a self antigen from a foreign antigen. And this tolerance is continued recognition and tolerance of self cells. So in some instances, these self cells will be attacked by antibodies and auto reactive T cells. Um, if, if mutations will occur in the lymphocytes, if cells in particular organs are never exposed to the immune system, or if these lymphocytes are called autoreactive. If lymphocytes do begin attacking cells, there are mechanisms to stop this. In clonal de deletion, these lymphocytes that recognize cell antigens will be destroyed in what we call apoptosis. In clonal energy, these lymphocytes are prevented from becoming active. Um, and this is where regulatory T lymphocytes will likely do this. You have central and peripheral tolerance. Uh, central just occurs in the thymus and your bone marrow and peripheral is anywhere outside of those two. Uh, passive immunity is the passing of antibodies from one individual to another. So active immunity um, was if you get exposed to the virus, whether it's through a vaccine or another way. Passing of passive immunity is the passing of antibodies from one individual to another. So the person does not make their own antibodies. This provides temporary protect protection um, from the mother to the fetus, from the mother to the child in breast milk and colostrum uh, right when the baby is born or artificially via immunization uh, like snake antivenom. So this is a great uh, care table comparing active and passive immunity. And I would really encourage you to understand this table well, because there will probably be at least a couple questions of active and passive immunity on the test. Um, and usually it, the method, again, it'll tell you the time to develop resistance, the duration, when it's used, um, and also what you're injecting the person with. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, so we're talking about passive immunity. These are animals that are ejected with an antigen um, a single B lymphocyte that makes the desired antibodies will be extracted. The B cell is fused with a cancerous myeloma cell in vitro, and the hybridoma will produce many clones that produce antibodies specific for the antigen. And then I think we'll end kind of with tumor immunology and a little more some of your immune system diseases. So oncology has shown that tumor biology is similar to and interrelated with functions of your immune system. And that's because tumors are abnormal clonal cells that will de-differentiate to an embryonic state. Uh, tumor growth and de-differentiation reveals antigens that can stimulate the destruction of the cell by cytotoxic T cells. So cancer cells will just destroy your own body's immune cells. Uh, benign tumors are slow growing and limited to specific areas of the body. Malignant tumors are fast growing and spread to other parts of the body. And we call the spreading of um, cancer to other parts of the body metastasizing. Uh, cancers will arise when the immune cells fail to stop the growth or spread of the tumors. And this will result from altered expression of oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, or genes that code for microRNA. Um, this takes you through a little bit of tumor antigens. I won't ask you too many other questions about tumors. I included this in here just in case um, you're a little bit interested in tumors and cancer. Um, this shows how a destruction of a cancer cell, a killer T cell um, will attack the cancer cell. Um, so I'll let you guys kind of read through. The natural killer cells are related to T lymphocytes but part of an innate immunity without the ability to recognize specific antigens. 
They will kill compromised cells in the same manner as cytotoxic T cells. Um, cytokines will release natural killer cells and they will activate both innate and adaptive immune cells. Uh, therapeutic monoclonal antibodies, interferons and interleukin-2 have been used to treat cancer. None of these can cure cancer, but they do sometimes help people. Other cytokines are currently being tested against cancer as well. Um, effects of aging and stress. So uh, the susceptibility to cancer varies greatly with aging and stress. Cancer risk increases with age, and this could just be due to uh, your lymphocytes mutating with age. Your thymus functions are also reduced, which will cause a decrease in your cell-mediated immune competence. And tumors will also grow faster that they've shown in lab animals under stress. Uh, stress will induce the release of cortisone, which is known to su suppress the immune system. Um, so try to stay calm and don't get stressed out to avoid uh, potential cancer later in life. All right, so finally, uh, disease caused by the immune system. So autoimmunity is produced when by failure of immune cells to recognize and tolerate your self antigens. So autoreactive T lymphocytes and autoantibodies will be produced causing inflammation and organ damage. And very common autoimmune diseases that you guys have probably heard of are rheumatoid arthritis, type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, Graves disease, which is a hyperthyroidism, pernicious anemia, thyroiditis, um, psoriasis and lupus. So these are autoimmune diseases where the failure of your immune cells, they're unable to recognize and tolerate self antigens anymore. So basically your immune system doesn't recognize itself anymore. So it begins to kill off its own cells. So that's, um, these are autoimmune diseases. Um, so here's the disease and uh, the antigen that is involved. I don't think you guys really need to know the antigen. Um, it might just be interested to know where exactly the antigen will be present. So the Graves disease will be associated with your thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, rheumatic fever will affect your heart valves. Um, glomerular nephritis will affect your kidney. Uh, diabetes mellitus type one affects the beta cells in the pancreatic islets in the pancreas. So they're unable to produce um, insulin and multiple sclerosis, its antigens are components of myelin sheaths. Um, so it will degrade the myelin sheaths of your nervous system. Reasons why self-tolerance may fail. So why does your body unable um, to be okay with itself? Because in autoimmune diseases, it starts to attack its own self. So this is what we're talking about. Um, an antigen not normally exposed to the immune system will become exposed, like in the example of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or a normally tolerated antigen is combined with a foreign haptin, uh, which is a foreign agent. This may occur when a drug such as aspirin will combine with platelets, resulting in the destruction of platelets. Um, more reasons why self-tolerance may fail, antibodies will be pr produced um, that are aimed at other antibodies, which will be the cause of inflammation in RA or rheumatoid arthritis, or antibodies produced against foreign antigens will cross-react with self antigens and begin attacking the self cells. So this occurs in the heart valves, um, the kidneys after um, strep throat, and it can lead to rheumatic fever or glomerular nephritis. Self antigens may be presented to T helper cells along with MHC2 molecules. So this could occur after a viral infection, type one diabetes or Graves disease, or um, there's just inadequate regulatory T cell activity. Allergies is any abnormal response to an allergen or its antigen. It's also called hypersensitivity. You can have immediate hypersensitivity or delayed hypersensitivity. Immediate is abnormal B cell response to an allergen. It affects our seen seconds to minutes after exposure, like in different types of foods, peanut butter, nuts, bee stings, pollen, and this just kind of shows you the process of what cells will be interacted to secrete these IgE antibodies with allergies. Immediate hypersensitivity continued. These antibodies do not circulate in the blood, but they'll attach to mast cells and basophils. And when re-exposed to the same allergen, these antibodies will bind with it and stimulate the production of histamine, leukotrienes, and prostaglandin D, which will just produce um, your basic allergy symptoms, which we're probably all familiar with. 
So this is just the mechanism of immediate hypersensitivity um, and the allergen, how it is bound uh, to these antibodies and how it becomes an allergy. Allergy testing, so we can test for different allergies by placing um, them on the forearm of the skin. And then these are markers measuring um, how much those different allergens are spreading or growing on the surface of the skin. So this is a, a way you can test kids. Um, she's a young adult, so she probably was allergic to things when she was young, and maybe they're trying to see if she's still allergic to it now. Common allergies, these are dust mites, so dust and pollen. Uh, delayed hypersensitivity is an abnormal T cell response that produces symptoms 24 to 72 hours after exposure. An example of this will be um, contact dermatitis caused by poison oak, poison ivy, or sumac. And this is a look at some differences between the immediate and delayed reaction. Again, this might be a good chart to understand. I, I would probably ask a question about this uh, just because allergies are so common and you'd probably um, interact with allergies in your medical fields in the future. And that's the end of chapter 15. So we have a test on this coming weekend. I hope you guys are all doing well.